It's awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us on today's webinar, uh, which uh, is about the Blockbuster DAO. My name's Lou Kerner, and I am uh, with Blockchain Co-Investors. We're a crypto fund to fund invested in 30 of the leading crypto VCs in the world. And we also IPO to crypto SPAC uh, in November. Um, we've got a great call today. Um, you know, uh, uh, in November uh, last year, in about five days, the um, Constitution DAO raised $47 million to buy, you know, a copy of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and while they were not successful, they were outbid uh, by another bidder. Um, I, I think they woke up a lot of the world to the potential of DAO's potential to aggregate a bunch of capital very quickly. Um, you know, and then get on this path to decentralization. And so, you know, there are a lot of new projects uh, that have just come out, you know, since that time, just in the last number of weeks. Uh, the Lynx DAO is really excited. You know, their, uh, uh, Mike Dudas has uh, started a group to go out and buy some golf courses. That sounds like a lot of fun. And, and the one that interested me the most uh, was the Blockbuster DAO. Uh, it started uh, on Christmas Day uh, by a synonymous uh, gentleman who's on the call with us today. Uh, and it quickly scaled to over 8,000 members. And uh, in its first few weeks, it made contact with uh, Echo Star Dish Network, the owner of uh, uh, Blockbuster. So in a very short period of time, they've made tremendous progress. Uh, and my guess is that there are a lot of lessons to, to, to learn from this. So I'm excited to have three members uh, of, of the DAO with us today. Uh, they're each gonna talk about you know, the DAO from, from their perspective uh, for about five to seven minutes, and then uh, we'll leave the back half of the call for Q&A from the audience. So if you have a question, put it into the, uh, the uh, Q&A function on Zoom. And if we pick your question, uh, we'll let you know via the chat. Uh, and uh, when it's your turn, uh, you, we will actually open up your audio and video and you can ask the question yourself and, and any appropriate follow-up. So it's super interactive. Uh, and with that, you know, I'd like to introduce our, our three speakers today, uh, starting with the founder of the Blockbuster DAO, Tasa Filia. So Tasa, welcome. Hey, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lou. Uh, and uh, you're calling in from Los Angeles? Yes, sir. Oh, terrific. Welcome. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Mihai now from uh, calling in. Welcome. Another member. Now you're actually a member of the leadership team, correct? That's right. I'm. Um, I'm. I joined. I joined the the blockbuster DAO literally the day after Tasafila announced it, and uh, I, I was uh, blessed enough to be part of the of the core team, and I, I'm I'm part of the core team now, and I'm also the co-founder and CEO of. Beep, which is a Web3 uh, video platform. So, you know, something that's actually very akin, obviously, to what the Blockbuster DAO is doing. Yes. Yeah. Very, okay, very. So terrific. So this we're excited. Space that. Connected. <laughs> so excited to have you. Uh, and uh, last, we have Adam Miller from uh, the DAO platform. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm one of the 8,000 plus uh, members of, of Blockbuster DAO, so not at least not yet part of the leadership team, but part of the, the greater DAO team. Well, terrific. Well, obviously, that's what most people are doing, but you're bringing this perspective, you know, from somebody who is uh, spending a lot of time thinking about DAO. So why don't you tell folks quickly what the, the DAO platform does? Yeah, DAOplatform.io. So we are providing uh, everything that you need to start and operate a DAO successfully, um, especially focusing on the tech stack. So looking at all the technology that's out there and helping identify, configure, integrate, and launch and operate all the technology that you need for your DAO. Um, as we go, we're looking for opportunities to build some of our own technology as well. Um, the idea is we'd like to be able to provide a DAO in a box so that if you want a DAO, you can have a DAO. Huh. Well, something that I think uh, uh, it would probably be, be helpful to, to Blockbuster DAO as they move down the path towards a decentralization. Um, and so, again, as I said, we're going to start off uh, and, and each of you will you know, uh, uh, share some comments for hopefully around five to seven minutes and we'll open it to Q&A. Uh, and we'll start uh, the formal comment section with uh, Tasa Filia. So, Tasa. Yeah, I am um, absolute pleasure to be here and, um, you know, 
uh, when it comes to Blockbuster DAO, uh, it, it was really lightning in a bottle. And that's kind of how Web3 goes these days. And, and, you know, it's beyond, you know, kind of the tech revolution and things happen. What normally would happen in six months, maybe in, in, the, in you know, uh, the dot com boom now happens in, you know, seven hours. Right. And uh, we saw that in December. Uh, and it's pretty it's spectacular how many people have come through uh, into our community and have um, really, uh, you know, grown into the idea of, of decentralization. But beyond that, something more intrinsically valuable to what we stand for and what we want to achieve. And, um, you know, it, it's been a real whirlwind uh, kind of. Like, I think it's it's kind of like an opposite problem that you normally want to have in, in kind of, I, I come from like an e-commerce background. I come from a SaaS background where uh, everybody's goal is hyperscale. And we didn't really have a problem with that to start off. And if anything, we had to kind of like pull back the reins on scale and say, okay, like, you know, there's, there's too much uh, desire to go fast, right? And we've, we've slowed down and we've taken a step back to really assess what is a really intricate product that we're trying to build and a really intricate problem that we're trying to solve. And um, I, I feel that we've been very successful in being able to, um, you know, kind of take a different approach into assessing decentralization and really understanding uh, and learning from our predecessors like uh, Constitution DAO or learning from how Lynx DAO has, has uh, gone to market. So can, did can you talk about a little bit about kind of what your DAO experience was, you know, prior to starting this DAO and, and, uh, and what the genesis of, of the, uh, of the Blockbuster DAO was? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I don't have any, uh, DAO experience and I, I don't think there's, there's too many people that really do have DAO experience. Right. And so, uh, I've always been watching and I, I've always been a, a big proponent of, um, you know, creating more progressive uh, uh, internal policies at companies to promote equity within. And I, I've always thought of it from a point of centralization and just being like, you know, a Dan Price type figure uh, who maybe just it, it wants to it has a more progressive vision of how to run, a, you know, a capitalist business. Right. And uh, over time, I've, I've really come to understand DAOs as the future of being able to uh, you know, not have to do that from a point of centralization. So I've been watching and, and waiting, and I think we're getting to the point where there's a little bit more clarity on what's needed for a DAO and, and what we need to accomplish in order to do that successfully and to avoid, um, you know, kind of the uh, pressures that we see from, you know, uh, the SEC and how we're supposed to monetize these things and, and make it work. So <clears throat> can you talk about um, uh, at all, um, at least, you know, what you've disclosed uh you know with your uh down members yeah. on the conversations uh you, you had with dish today uh well we can't really talk about our conversations with dish right now just out of uh, respect for the relationship but i can't say it's it's a very uh positive relationship and i, I can say that you know i feel very aligned with their team and i think they feel the same and you know when you started, did you start off, did you have this idea of putting together a, a leadership team or was that something that evolved? Um, yeah, of course. And I think, you know, it's kind of one of the interesting things of when you have like this product, like uh, in a perfect world, I imagined Blockbuster DAO and I wrote it when I had two followers on Twitter and it was just kind of this like uh, this prospectus of an idea and it was just like a glimmer of an idea and it blew up the next day. Uh, because Constitution Dow retweeted us. And uh, I think the hard part was, you know, in, in a world where it moved, it grew slowly, I would be able to kind of flesh out and have the time to think about who needs to join, like, who do I need? What, where do we need the help and the assistance and the support? And, um, you know, things happen so fast that, you know, people, I had to rely a lot on kind of like a, a feeling or a gut feeling and people like Mihai have not only like obviously this like storied background with just so much incredible experience, but just like good people. And I felt like I relied on that, like set, that there's like a, it's not a, like a, an objective or practical, uh, uh, you know, um, metric, but it just a, a subjective feeling about, you know, how somebody carries themselves in a conversation, how they approach the immediate challenges, you know, 
are they trying to push things too fast or are they willing to like see it out and see the problems for what they are and and you know i, I felt like i had to rely a lot on on that kind of subjective metric and, and i think we've done a great job bringing in people who just really care and who bring a, a level of passion and energy oh, it sounds it sounds like a lot of fun yeah. um uh, b before last question uh and then we'll go to mihai um what was the one thing you know that you wish you knew before you started um i don't know i i think um I think there's a lot of things i still want to know um i don't know <laughs> if that counts uh but because i feel like i'm always learning but I, I think one of the things i i wish i and I still want to know is just, um, I think, you know, it's something I'm always dealing with is just maintaining um, expectations. And, and I, I think that's kind of a lifelong journey, I feel, where like, you know, it's easy to like make empty promises or at the same time tell people nothing. And you have to kind of balance that out. And that's something that I think at the beginning, I, I felt like I, I had all these promises to keep uh based on a perspective that i just thought was you know a very like future forward idea and um you know now i think we've kind of like figured out what that mvp is and, and how to kind of rein it in and then you know build a structure and a foundation to get there interesting um you know when uh when i first saw the crypto light you know uh mid-2017 and i made a uh new year's resolution in 2018 you know, 10 years resolution one of them was to help clamp down all the vitriol in in the community um you know and over time i've come to appreciate that the vitriol in a lot of ways is more of a feature than a bug because people are super passionate uh about this yep. um so uh so thanks a lot uh Tasa, for sticking around for the q a session yep. um you know and again if anybody in the audience uh has a question put it into the q a uh and now we'll turn it over uh, to Mihai. So you are on mute. Oh. Not anymore. I'm here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what can I tell you, Lou? So talked about your experience. So you know, had you had much experience with DAOs before joining the Blockbuster DAO? As an observer, I would say I I was observing the 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 space for a while. Um, I even tweeted, I think, uh, I don't know, back in October or November that, you know, as much as 2021 was the year of the NFTs, I feel and I foresee that 2022 will be the year of the DAOs. Uh, and probably that's, that's a very uh, basic, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, projection that anyone could have done. But my, my gut feeling is that, you know, after, after spending myself about 25, almost 30 years in business and starting companies and, and working in different companies, um, DAOs have a property that's absolutely unique, which is bring together the passion and the energy of uh, a whole community together in a blink, in a second. Uh, and I don't know, something kind of magical happens when people feel aligned uh, by the same objectives or uh, desires or problems they want to solve. Um, and suddenly you have a lot of talent and a lot of great ideas that come together. Um, and, and things are extremely chaotic, but they do fall in, in place. Uh, not by themselves, for sure. There, there's, there's a lot of need of coordination, but it still remains chaotic. So for me, that, that was what showed me that, in a way, that's probably one of the next evolutions of human organization. Right. I mean, we as humans have a hard time organizing ourselves. It's it's tough. You know, the, the number of books about, you know, how to set up uh, human communities, it's it's limitless uh, in business or in society. But DAOs have this organic way to come together uh, na almost naturally, I would say that it's probably much easier to after that, after they come together organically, 
set up some structures so they start functioning in a much more efficient way uh, and start delivering results. So what I see with the Blockbuster DAO is uh, what Tasafira was saying. I mean, literally for me, one day was a season. I mean, the number of things that were happening in one day was just insane. Um, and, and there is no way even the most efficient startups can achieve so much progress in such a short period of time. But up to a certain point, up to a certain point, you need structure, organization, uh, documentation, um, you know, a commun better communication because things tend to happen everywhere. A and then, you know, set up governance tools and so on. So I think we're in at that point in time with the Blockbuster DAO, where we have to now uh, start implementing those kind of more formal tools to give it a more uh, structured way to push it forward. Can you talk a little bit about how you've been engaging with the community to this point? Yeah, so literally when, when I saw uh, Tasafira's tweet, I said, oh my God, I mean, that's, that's insane. I mean, besides the fact that, you know, back, you know, literally almost 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, I would say, uh, I used to work in, in video distribution in France and I was about, my company was doing what Netflix used to do in the US, you know, online DVD rentals, then we start to do video on demand. Mm -hmm. And at some point, my company was looking at buying the French equivalent of Blockbuster. Uh, we didn't manage because they were very arrogant and very pricey. Mm -hmm. Then they went to chapter 11, like Blockbuster did. <laughs> and when I sold my company uh, that was already on demand and everything you want, the company who bought us, they bought chapter 11, the other company, and they changed the name. So they become like the French blockbuster. So that rang a bell. The second thing that uh, appealed to me is the, the fact that uh, we're talking about decentralization. And I think, uh, you know, that's probably the topic for another seminar, <laughs> webinar, right, about decentralized media and what it really means. Uh, but I think it's a revolution that can happen only with Web3 tools. And those two things together, plus, you know, what I had as an experience from content licensing and media distribution and, and vote platforms and what we've built for Beam in the last three, four years, uh, that felt like, oh my God, that cannot be, it's, it's surreal. So I reached out to Tasafila and, and we, we, we exchanged, we discussed and, uh, you know, the co community grew very, very fast in a matter of hours of days. And I got more and more involved, you know, in, in trying to work on, you know, the vision, the strategy, the platforms, what fe what's feasible, you know, the brand uh, discussions with Dish. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I unearthed a, a 50 pages white paper that with my co-founder we wrote in 2018 about the decentralized ecosystem for media you know uh, where a bunch of ideas we, we we thought about them for at least a year so it was extremely aligned extremely aligned. and what i most appreciate is uh tasafila's vision and passion and honesty uh, and transparency with the community to move that forward and, and his understanding of, of the space. Um, and again, I think that kind of energy brought a bunch of very, very incredible people around the table. Otherwise, I can't explain how those incredible people ended up in, in this Discord channel, right? Which there's a so, thousand of them. Yeah. So uh, uh, before we go on, right Adam, I'll ask you then the, the same co uh, question I asked Tasa, which is, what do you wish you knew about DAOs uh, before you got involved uh, with Blockbuster DAO that you know now? I think I'm happy. I didn't know much more than I, I knew, which is not much, um, because it's a completely new space. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a space ready for design uh, in terms of mental models, tools, uh, organization tools. And yes, DAOs are around for a couple of years, but they're DAOs that work around low level protocols or other very, very specific projects. I think the Blockbuster DAO is so specific that it has to do with a huge business, which with a huge, I mean, 
what the blockbuster DAO wants to achieve, it's 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 something that I don't know, an AT and T or Warner Media or Netflix or you know those kind of big companies can dream of achieving, and I don't think they can because the only way to make it it's by being decentralized. So if I if I knew more, I I could have probably took it in the wrong way by saying, oh, no, no, that's not the way to do it, guys, because you know the experience of uh, the last couple of DAOs is this and that which doesn't mean much, right? It's it's really, really early stages. Okay, well, terrific. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mihai, for uh, for sticking around for the Q&A. And then the, the last formal comments uh, will come from Adam. Yeah, thanks, Lou. Um, really interesting conversation so far. You know, my experience with DAO started um, several months ago. Um, my crypto journey uh, began long before that, but as soon as I started uh, seeing what was happening with DAOs um, towards the end of last year, I got inextricably uh, obsessed. Um, you know, this ability to organize people and resources in a whole new way can change everything. Um, from how people organize chess clubs at high schools to how governments and international associations are run and literally everything in between. Um, you know, if anyone's just getting started with DAOs, um, you know, I would say, uh, just like a lot of people have said about NFTs over the past year, go try one, find a DAO and join the DAO. Now, what does join the DAO mean? It's going to mean something completely different um, for each DAO, um, but find usually their Discord, um, but find them online and there will be a welcome message or an introduction channel with instructions. Maybe you have to fill out a form. Maybe you just have to go introduce yourself in a particular Discord channel. Uh, maybe just uh, saying you're interested is enough to be considered part of the DAO. So um, just go do it. Um, I totally agree um, with Mihai that 2022 is going to be the year of the DAO. Uh, something shifted in the past couple months. Um, anyone I talked to who has been in the DAO space for a while would agree that there has been a sea change in people going from interested in DAOs as they've been for several years to, oh my God, like something's happening. We got to be a part of this. We got to build stuff. We got to make DAOs happen. Um, so it's a really good time to be getting involved. Um, you know, Lou mentioned earlier that um, one of the values that I can bring to the table is help with the tech stack. I think that's very true. Um, and, um, you know, Taz said that not many people have experience with DAOs. And I'll, I'll just one up that and say uh, not many people have much experience with DAOs or with the underlying technology. Um, you know, there are uh, so many different types of DAOs out there. Um, you know, we're talking about Blockbuster DAO today, which uh, maybe you could call it a, um, a, an entertainment DAO, or in some senses, it's like an investment DAO because we're um, potentially raising money and then uh, using it to purchase a brand. Um, you could think of it as um, a, a lot of different ways. And you heard Taz talk about some of those earlier. Um, there's organizations that aren't even doing anything on blockchain that could probably be considered DAOs. Think about uh, Toastmasters or Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, these are two hugely successful organizations that do nothing on the blockchain yet that I know of, at least. They don't have any tokens, um, but they're successful, global, um, decentralized, and in some ways autonomous organizations. Um, you know, if you look on chain, what's happening today? Uh, Lou, uh, Lou you're, you're yeah. No, I was just going to say uh, humorously when, you know, when I first, uh, uh, you know, I saw the crypto light and about the three or four months later, uh, joined the Chabad house. Um, and uh, was surprised when uh, the rabbi said the most important thing about how you have to understand about about Habat is that it's decentralized. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So lots of yeah, <laughs> successful off-chain DAOs. Yes, yes. And maybe the part that they're necessarily missing if they're off-chain is the autonomous part, because I think the A of, of DAO, the autonomous, um, tends to refer to the te technological automation that happens when you're doing uh, something, uh, some kind of governance on-chain. Um, but, uh, you know, and with respect to that, I'll share, uh, to me, there are three key elements of any DAO. Um, and you can go from these three elements down into what's a tech stack that makes them possible. One of the elements is tokenization. 
right? Any uh, modern DAO, any crypto DAO is going to have some element of tokens eventually. Um, they could be uh, fungible tokens like regular uh, ERC-20, you know, regular tokens, uh, cryptocurrencies, they, uh, like cryptocurrencies, they could be NFTs, um, right? They could be like passes or tickets that get you membership or access in some way to the DAO. Um, and there are whole suites of tools for managing how you create tokens, how you distribute tokens, how you manage tokens. Um, and then usually those tokens will have something to do with the governance of the DAO. Um, and so governance is the next category. How do you make decisions as a group? Um, do people vote? And what type of uh, vote counting and vote mechanisms um, do you use? Are the votes counted on chain or off chain? Um, and so governance uh, often is connected to treasury because you wanna control the treasury of the tokens with governance. The third part of three is the community element. So, you know, you heard, um, uh, you know, earlier Mihai said that something like communities can be infinitely complex. And um, I think it is important to remember that DAOs, just like any other group of people, have all of the challenges that you get whenever you get groups of people together and try to organize them and get them to accomplish something together. Uh -huh. um, and that space really is infinite and it's unsolved, right? I mean, we have solutions, but none of them are perfect. And it's something that everyone is trying to solve these, any leader is trying to solve this problem, right? It's not something that's unique to DAOs. But DAOs enable a whole new set of technology solutions that can help you organize the community. And so whether it's leveraging your tokens and your governance in some way to incentivize uh, community participants and contributors to act in certain ways, whether it's new chat platforms like Discord or uh, online forums or task management or you know, automated distribution of tokens, right? All of these things can help you organize a community in ways that were never possible before. Um, and as you, you know, and, and as you know, you've gone around and you've seen different DAOs using these tools in different way. You know, have have there been any DAOs that have really stood out to you that wow, you know, those guys are really organized. They're really doing some interesting things. And you know, and if there are folks in the audience who want to see, you know, obviously everybody's going to go to Blockbuster DAO. Who wouldn't? But you know, if you're going to go to another DAO and get involved in another DAO as well, you know, and just want to learn about DAOs, that you would say, hey, you know, these guys, you know, seem to have the DAO thing down. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I'd say the example I would use of a well-established DAO that's already doing a lot uh, on chain and has a well-functioning community um, is DX DAO. Um, so DXDAO is a few years old. They have uh, many tens of millions of dollars in their treasury, um, and they've created several DeFi products. So for example, Swapper is probably the best known, and it's one of the leading um, DEXs on a Gnosis chain and Arbitrum, um, and also um, uh, you can use it on Ethereum. Um, they've created several other DeFi products. Um, and what's cool about DXDAO, and by the way, they're all, they, they, their technology stack is a fork of DAO stack, which is one of the leading uh, DAO platforms. I um, actually just had a conversation last night with uh, the founder and CEO of, of DAO stack, Matan, and they're doing some amazing stuff. Lots of cool stuff coming in the next couple of years. Um, DXDAO is a fork of DAO stack. They do everything on chain. So from uh, every element of how they spend their treasury, um, every element of controlling their software, their, their, their DEX and their, their other DeFi protocols um, is actually managed by um, the, the reputation holders in their case. So they have tokens and they have reputation, which is in a sense, another type of token. They can actually manage those products. Um, so it's a very organized community. If you find their Discord or their website, um, you know, you can dive in and say, hey, I'm interested in learning more, or especially if you're an engineer, um, there's always a need for more engineers to contribute to the work. So um, <laughs> that would be one example. And maybe a, another one that you can easily um, see what's happening, but maybe harder to get involved would be something like Curve DAO. The Curve is one of the leading, it's a leading DeFi protocol. It's a, kind of like a DEX if you're familiar with DEXs, which is decentralized exchange, but they're focused on uh, stable coins. So swapping one stable coin for another stable coin, um, they have a fully automated- and, and which, which is a huge business. I mean, it's huge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Massive. Yeah. Stable coins have become huge because people want to use crypto and blockchain sometimes without getting exposure to the underlying blockchain assets, right? They just want to have their assets denominated in dollars. Um, everything about the curve protocol, so the software itself is governed on chain by people who hold certain types of tokens voting on, for example, what incentives will be provided, what rates will be charged in the various 
um, pools where you're swapping these tokens. And what's amazing is entire businesses have sprung up that are based around helping organize the tokens that are used in governance and then voting on behalf of all of those tokens to control what happens yeah, convex. Um, with the DAO. <laughs> convex, yeah. And there's a whole thing called the Curve Wars. If you Google the yeah. Curve Wars, find it on Bankless, which is a fantastic uh, media yeah. podcast. It's, um, it's fascinating. Uh, Agreed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Super interesting. And, um, you know, one that I talk about too that is, um, you know, not a fin you know, financial related is a Brain Trust, which is a, a decentralized uh, talent network that's, you know, scaling super rapidly. Um, and so, well, terrific, Adam. You know, thanks for those comments. That was uh, that was great, and thanks for sticking around for the Q and A. Uh, again, if you have uh, a question from the audience, uh, if you're in the audience and you have a question, uh, feel free uh, to put it in the Q and A section. And if we pick your question, uh, we will let you know. Uh, and so, we're going to go now to questions from the audience. And let me see the first question. Hold on just a moment. Uh, first question. One second. Do, do comes from Carlos Sanchez. And let's see, there you go. Carlos should be promoted to panelist. Let's turn on your video. There you go. All right. Hello. Welcome. Where are you, where are you uh, calling in from, Carlos? Los Angeles, uh, Culver City. There are a couple studios there. <laughs> yes, there are. Yes, there are. And. Uh, uh, an old friend of of, of Mihai's. Uh, old business part started off as business partners, and an old friend of Mihai's. I, I currently work in distribution at at, Le at Legendary Television, a uh, part of Legendary Studios. So I'm a I'm a novice on all things DAO. Um, Mihai's educated a little bit me on in, in the crypto world, but looking at looking at things from a legacy point of view, um, let's say an, an independent film, um, an, uh, um, a financier gets a great gets a great script attaches some some talent to it, finances finances the movie, takes it to a film festival or a film market like Sundance or AFM or what have you. And pre-COVID, pre-COVID, a distributor might pick it up and, and give it the sort of windowed release of theatrical release, home entertainment release, pay pay one window, and 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 the creator would be remunerated from these various windows. Okay. With with COVID, with COVID, obviously the theatrical the theatrical elements a little bit is it's obviously largely diminished. So you have obviously distributors or streamers buying buying the rights buying the rights outright, but the creator is only going to get conceivably just that, that one check. So there's no there's no more financial upside for the creator. Hopefully it's it's a really big check and there's an auction uh, process that happens at, at the festival or, or the film market and they can maximize it. But it's really a, it's it's a one shot pony sort of sort of deal. So the question is, <laughs> the question is the following. I had to set up, I had to set up the context yes. for the question. How do you envision a DAO, uh, such as the Blockbuster DAO, performing the, 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 the sort of role of the, of the old school studio as a true fiduciary to the creator, whereby if the DAO buys, gets the right to a particular project or film, and, and this maybe is a governance question, how, how do how 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 is the the ultimate the best economic outcome for that film managed through the DAO? Whereas they say instead of putting it on to Beam and having you know the the community members being able to to see it from a governance perspective, how do they make a decision where they're like, hey, now that the DAO is the owner of this film, it's it's best for this film for us to license it for five years to Netflix because that's that's the best outcome for the film, and when, and we could eventually bring it back to the community in, in some sort of community led environment like Beam, but I just, you know, it's really a governance question. I, was, I just wanted to see how, uh, just hear from the DAO experts, how, how you guys envision that sort of fiduciary role being played by a DAO. Thanks for the question, Carlos. Uh, Tasa, you wanna, you wanna start? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. I, I'm, um, I think like when we started a lot of the time, like we, we, we often thought about acquisition and film acquisition and, and kind of like thinking like Netflix and trying to just make a decentralized Netflix. And the more we've gone along, uh, I think we've kind of realized that that's not the need anymore, or like, that's not really, it's not solving anything. And it, it's really kind of uh, uh, defeating the purpose of what the, the movement is about. And for us, I think we try to think more about it like Shopify rather mm -hmm. than Netflix. And I, I think 
a, a better way to think about it is instead of the DAO actually owning any of the property, uh, the intellectual property, at least at the onset, is creating a system in which creators can retain their intellectual property instead of having to go sell it and then <clears throat> basically sell their baby. Like they can keep their baby, they can monetize it and however they want. They could have their theatrical release and then move it into their streaming category and then later on move it into their free to watch category on a, a centralized platform, centralized quote unquote, uh, it, it, meaning like they can also market their film on that platform. And really the way we think about it is just creating a system in which these people can uh, set up their own Shopify store as a uh, content streaming platform mm -hmm. in a, a cohesive and, and holistic uh, industry uh, uh, setting. Cool. I, I appreciate the Shopify analogy. That, 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 makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Mihai, anything, anything to add there? Yeah, so uh, I think I think uh, Tasafila um, pointed it right. Um, the 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 problem with distribution is when you have so many, I mean, so many or so few gatekeepers, and and when you start depending on the gatekeepers uh, to make a living and to try to connect uh, millions and millions of creators with billions of people who are the audience. And that goes through just a very handful of platforms, uh, that are supposed to have the absolute knowledge about what's good, what's bad, and make decisions on behalf of the creators and decisions on behalf of the users. You should watch that because you're going to like it. And your content is good, but your content is bad because we say so. Uh, or our algorithms show that our data show that your content is not great. Uh, I always thought that um, that's a very biased way. And I think there is no bad content. There's just a, a, a wrong audience, right? Uh, so um, putting the, you know, Web3 allows everyone uh, to put the, the um, audience and the creator at the center of the equation again. Uh, and uh, you have so many creators that maybe have, you know, some of them have hundreds of millions of followers or, or dozens of millions of followers, but others have just uh, tens of thousands of followers. And that's, that's enough. That's enough for a very specific niche. And those followers have a specific taste that would fit a specific type of content that might not have a place on a Netflix or an Amazon. So the range is so huge and no platform can segment anything like that because they got completely uh, sunk into the, the mass of content. How do you find that? No algorithm can, can dig it up. And I think you know what, what we're working at the DAO and what we've been working at Beam on the technological side is uh, instead of having those algorithmic, uh, algorithmic curations, uh, is to let people do what they always did. And that's why, you know, I always love the analogy with, with Blockbuster. You go to a store and you talk to a real human being, say, hey, that's what I like. And I, actually, you don't even say what I like. The guy starts knowing you by what you rent and your feedback. And he's going to tell you, try that. Oh, no, 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 that, no me, no way I'm going to like that. Trust me, try it, you'll see. And you discover, oh my God, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I told you. Right, because that's content. Content is not a credit card, right? That fits fits a you know credit score. So I th I think the distribution will will go there, um, and will will become much more fluid at the end of the day. Thank you. That was good. Thanks, Mihai, and thanks for the question, Carlos. Sure. And let's see uh, our next question. Let's see, it's going to come from Carrie Miller. So let's see, Carrie. Uh, let's see, bring you up on stage, and now you went away. Where are you here? Nothing is easy. Uh, now you're a panelist. Okay, let's see. Can you hear me? Can you there see you me? There you go. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> I was upgraded to a panelist. So, an incredible session. Great to see all y'all and to, to learn. So just by way of background, I'm the 
general partner of Overton Venture Capital. We invest in the changing consumer behavior. And I actually started my career in executive compensation and talent strategy, leaning towards incentives. So in this world of DAOs and a decentralized, this is like the golden ticket and I'm just fascinated in general. So my question to the panels, and I'm also involved in a DAO meta collective for building the first learning institution on the metaverse. So in this building of our DAO, we're also learning as we go in this white space opportunity and Wild West. Um, my question for Adam and, and the folks behind the Blockbusters DAO is, how do you think about incentives that are intangible? You know, obviously with tokenomics and everything that's going on, those kind of protocols that are being announced, it's very clear. And so in advising and thinking through others that are launching DAOs, how have you thought about that or started to think about the governance and making sure that those that are contributing in a meaningful way are compensated as well to align with it? And thanks again. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, Tasa, you want to start? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is just offering some sort of intrinsic, um, uh, like, having it really be part of like the organization's story and mission. And I think also giving people structure also helps. And, and sometimes in a DAO, things can be kind of frenzied and crazy. And you're, you know, people are just like picking up odd jobs and trying to like participate. And I think, um, you know, beyond just like obviously the compensation and there's lots of tools out there to compensate people for work, um, you know, in, in kind of a DAO uh, sphere. Uh, I think just really being overly communicative and, and offering that structure for people to participate and like having those on ramps to to jump into a specific part of the organization, or even um, we were looking at a DAO structure the other day that had uh, uh, different pods, and each pod had its own its own treasury and its own rule set, and like these pods all function separately, but as part of the greater DAO. And I thought it was a really cool concept because. In that sense, you know, you can have uh, creatives be creatives, and you can have uh, designers or uh, you know developers be developers, and you can have like uh, everybody be in their specific uh, uh, room with the people that they enjoy and maybe want to network with as well, because uh, that's definitely one of the reasons why I participate in, in these DAOs. And um, I, I think by giving people those kind of structures, you can create kind of an intrinsic value for people. <clears throat> Cool. <clears throat> Anything to add? Uh, you want to go? Me, I? Um, yeah, I think um, complementing what, what Safira was saying, I think incentives and uh, pay are essential. I mean, uh, there is there is a huge amount of goodwill that people are willing to put in a DAO at the beginning and a lot of work they're happy to do literally for free. Uh, which I think is essential because it allows others to judge, you know, how they work, who they are. Nobody asks you who you are. Maybe, maybe you know, many DAOs have just anonymous people working there. So nobody is showing up their resume <laughs> or so on, uh, although they could, right? Uh, so it's more based on what you can prove you can do and how you behave. And, you know, people can judge that way quite quickly. Um, but after that, you need you need to incentivize. You need you know people need to to pay the rent and the mortgage and and so on. So, so as as soon as the the DAO gets gets a treasury, um, th there's a number of ways to to define uh, payments that can be based per tasks, per projects, per time spent, per responsibility, uh, or even for the fact of voting and maintaining the DAO, and that has. I mean, it's very linked to the tokenomics of the DAO. Um, so if you go just for a governance token, that governance token, of course, is linked to voting and responsibility, but might have a monetary value uh, that then you want might want to keep like that or limit because you don't want whales to come in and kind <laughs> of influence your governance through a pure uh, you know, financial power. Yeah, but also, a lot of that. You, yeah, yeah you, you can also give utility. No, a utility token on top of the governance token, both could be linked, uh, and obviously NFT. So, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, we need to earn money. And I mean, 
you know, it's 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 two things. You know, one is is earnings and and compensation of work. The other thing is uh, having a role and a responsibility. And for many people, it's also so social signaling uh, that matters a lot, right? So <laughs> it's maybe on top of the compensation, and that's also a big incentive to have a specific role. Uh, no matter how much money you make, you can make a lot of money or very little, but yeah. you have a specific role that makes you, you know, someone relevant in your community. So uh, I think, yeah, I think there, yeah, right. Anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure there's a very specific answer. I, I do think it, well, let's it see. depends yeah. highly about the, you know, the, or the type of doubt. Right. So uh, uh, thanks, me. I, Adam, what do you, you know, what have you seen out there from other DAOs? And, you know, and I think, again, it's it's easier, certainly, to compensate people in a financial DAO like, you know, the DX DAO, although even that's challenging. Yeah, and I would actually say, and I don't know, Carrie, by the way, good to see you. I don't know if this is partly what you were thinking, but I would actually caution people um, to be very careful about what you incentivize with uh, financial rewards. Um, you know, there are plenty of studies in economics and psychology that show that if you, uh, for example, if you reward people too much for participating in a volunteer activity, they're less likely to come back and do that activity again. And seemingly because you've taken away the intrinsic reward of doing something good for the community. And sure, maybe you got a free lunch or a free jacket or something. But if you give them like a really valuable gift card, now they feel like they got paid for it. And it's actually less enjoyable and there's less intrinsic reward. Um, and so, you know, I think you want to think about um, both the intrinsic, you know, emotional reward, but also what are all the different categories of different types of uh, uh, rewards that you can provide? You know, you can give uh, levels and colors and symbols mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, NFTs like popes. You know, there's also studies that show that if you consistently give someone the same reward, it may not actually be as reinforcing as if you sometimes more randomly give them a reward. This is kind of a Pavlov's dog kind of thing. Um, and so maybe if you use Pope's uh, proof of attendance uh, protocol uh, tokens, which are NFTs that are, whose purpose is to say you were there or you did something, uh, maybe if you use those, but only occasionally, people will show up you know, to whatever the event or the, the meeting is, hoping that maybe this will be the time that there's a reward. So I think you should be really uh, careful about how you use incentives and think about the broad spectrum uh, of incentives that are out there. And thank Thanks. you so much. And what I've seen kind of so far, it's the keep it simple, stupid approach. Like when you are building, people have so much that's going on. If you can keep it simple and just align on kind of what you're you're driving towards. So thank you so much. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, our next question is going to come from Mark Savage. Mark. There you go, Mark. Yeah, that took a few minutes. Hey. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much, guys. I think you know my question is very much in the it seems in the theme that of the discussion here, and it's um, you know, just to, to preface it by saying I'm a total newbie to this space, but I've become <laughs> obsessed and fascinated in the last you know maybe month or so. Um, and Welcome I reached the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it goes deep. I think. Um, so yeah, I was just fascinated by what. Blockbuster DAO is doing and then DAOs in more general. And of course, um, my, my, my sort of question, I'm trying to form it in a clear way, but I suppose I'm at a place where there's a few of us in, in uh, you know, locally forming a natural kind of DAO. And we're wondering, how are we going to do this? And some of us have got quite a bit of, you know, business experience where, you know, you would form a company, basically, and you would, it would be, it's a centralized approach. And I'm just thinking, how do we get a balance right? And we're looking into, into the tokenomics of this. And I see there's a question already there about, you know, what kind of percentage is a good percentage to give to founders and all this type of stuff in terms of, you know, wanting to make sure that it's not a DAO in name only, that it is, it is a genuinely decentralized effort, but that also has a place for a core group who, who stand to basically, uh, I suppose, steer the project yeah, as well as potentially um, guide and be, you know, um, compensated. So in terms of whatever the tokenomics are that get decided. So, um, yeah, and 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 I, I don't know, I hopefully this is making sense. It's kind of a stream of consciousness here. Yeah. But no, look, I, I think it's quite in alignment, you know, so my, yeah. you know, myself, my wife are involved in uh, independent films here in the UK, and it's sort of been 
out of a frustration for many years about trying to get into that um, market that this is coming about. It's like, okay, can we do this ourselves? And you mentioned uh, NFTs, and that's kind of what we're looking at. Can we? Can we? Can that be a first step into this market? Okay, why don't when we start with uh, you want to uh, Adam? You want to because it's more of an NFT, you know, a, a a DAO related question, and you know, how does he start? How does he even know whether a DAO is the right thing to do? Well, that is a really good question. And, uh, you know, I would talk to people that you respect and trust, the people on this panel, others that are involved in the space, people who have been doing it for a little while who can help, who are willing to tell you whether or not you should be a DAO in the first place, and if so, what type. Um, and I just want to comment on part of what you brought up, which, and someone put it in the chat too, centralized versus decentralized, or even um, I have a friend in uh, Taoists um, who says that uh, we should call it distributed instead of decentralized, like distributed autonomous organizations, because often it's not about pushing all of the responsibility to the edges. It's just a, the fact that you can distribute as, as much as you want to. And maybe that still means you have a leadership team and, and as Blockbuster now does, and you have um, guilds or pods or, 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 you know, other team leaders, right, throughout the organization. And so you can still take advantage of all of the autonomous nature of, of a crypto, you know, uh, a hosted DAO, um, but not necessarily have to be completely decentralized. Uh, I think that's, I think that's spot on. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mihai or Tasha, you want to add anything to that? Uh, uh, yeah, I think, um, one of the things just piggybacking off, I love the distributed uh, edition. I feel like that's so necessary because uh, the first thing I, I learned very quickly jumping into this space is that uh, there are a lot of maximalists out there who have this like utopian <laughs> vision of like everything ex like is functioning in this like completely decentralized way where you're almost not doing anything right or, or you, you just are voting all the time. And it's just not realistic and you need execution and you need somebody to at least help relay information and communication is a huge part of it. So really, realistically, it's like uh, for us, we just learned that transparency is probably more valuable than anything. And we don't have the voting mechanism. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have like necessarily a, a strong, like, like decentralized structure, but we do act very transparently. And we make sure that we're keeping people informed and keeping the communication channels open. And then over time, when we get to really important decisions that actually matter, like those are the decisions that we'll have votes for, but we don't need that for everything. And just like, you know, like we're working on our white paper right now, like that's something we're working on internally and then we'll release it, it, it to the public and then they can, or the public or the community rather, and then they can vote on that. They can add comments and allow a comment period and kind of have a, a core structure that is centralized, but it is distributed and there is a lot of transparency and communication at least for now okay thanks tasa so mark you get yet get have your question answered yeah that's really fantastic thank you guys for making what might have been like a kind of a waffly question i really love what you said there um adam about not needing to push everything to the edges i love that and and it's really um helpful um uh, tasa Filia, to uh to know that, you know, I because re I really resonate with that as a, as a transparency being a core value. I think that's, yeah, yeah. No, I really resonate with all that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the question. Um, Pleasure. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to take the last question, um, but before I do that, there's uh, one from the audience from somebody who didn't want to come up. That's a quick one. And that interesting question, is there a percentage of token ownership for founders that's reasonable you know, or unreasonable in forming a DAO. And, you know, Adam, maybe I'll start with you again as the DAO expert. You know, after. you can draw from the very old field of uh, crypto tokenomics, um, <laughs> which really is just a few years old. Um, but going back to the ICO craze of 2017, 18, um, this was something people had to figure out for a similar use case, which was um, ICOs, right? Distributing tokens to communities. And they weren't thinking about them as DAOs, but sometimes they were kind of similar. Um, and so you can find all kinds of charts and white papers about um, the right way to um, split the tokens between, you know, founders, uh, early uh, adopters, and then maybe you do a sale to investors. And maybe there's a separate sale to accredited investors that are larger investors. And then there's certain pools reserved for the community in the short term and over time. So Unfortunately, I'm not going to give you a particular percentage. If I had to pick, I'd say like 
10 to 30 percent um i'm not going to give you one but here's one yeah exactly <laughs> um, yeah. what about and and what about i mean it seems that there's been kind of this movement to kind of what what's being called fair launch in terms of token distribution yeah and, and, yeah yeah and there's really interesting um now protocols right apps that you can use to distribute tokens in really creative ways so like um if you look at uh, copper is a DeFi app that um, allows you to do interesting types of token launches. And recently, a Colony DAO, which is a DAO platform, did their token launch there. And so that's something you could uh, look into and and uh, check out. So it's never never a dull moment. So thanks thanks for that question. Um, and then you know I'll, I'll give uh, give each of you this the same question. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll start uh, start with you, Mihai. If if uh, we're here. Uh, in a year, um, and having a you know a, a similar call, uh, what do you think we'll be talking about in a year that we weren't talking about today? Um, how to connect uh, DAOs, DeFi, um, NFTs uh all together uh into into different platforms uh, actually all those different things live in different spaces right now uh all these things will come will be brought together and i think that's gonna be like a version two of everything right now is the primitives of yeah, uh, yeah. Of early of days that, <laughs> and early days so i think a year from yeah. now is gonna be like the the Again, the next iteration where you know we're not in the plumbing so much anymore, but more on the higher levels. Makes sense, Adam. There will be some tech platforms that have been shown to be reliable and successful in helping you manage your DAO. Versus today, where I could tell you the ten leading platforms, all of which I've launched DAOs on, all leave a lot to be desired. Um, as amazing as as the people are who are building them, so that's that's going to really change in twenty twenty two. Uh, that would be awesome, and, and and I think all those people recognize the you know that we're that they're early days. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, so thanks, Adam. Thanks, Mihai. And then we'll leave the last words uh, uh, for Tasa. Yeah, I think uh, I've been absolutely floored by the amount of growth and the amount of talent that's coming out of the uh, film NFT space, and I'm so excited this year to see uh, some amazing content creators like. David Bianchi and Jordan Bain and Julie Pacino and Mas Matteo Santoro, Jennifer Esposito, like they, all these great names are like making um, incredible projects right now. And uh, I'm so excited to see what they do this year. Yeah, so that's really incredible what's going on all over. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, 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 thanks, Adam. Thanks, Mihai. Thanks, Tasa, for, uh, for a great call. See everyone thank later. You. Bye, thank everyone. You, Bye, thank everyone. You.